Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8, and uh, you kind of need to see the big flow through here. There's been just uh, amazing things happening in, in the life of the early church, and um, we've come to the place where the apostles seem to be content with staying in Jerusalem and not moving out into the rest of the world, as chapter 1 verse 8 uh, asked them to do. And so what we're going to find is that persecution over the preaching of Stephen is going to occur in chapter 8. And these wonderful Hellenistic Jews, believers, are going to be spread throughout the world. And as they went, the gospel went with them. And we're going to tonight, we're going to talk about Philip and uh, what a wonderful, wonderful Christian leader he is. And um, I've always been amazed. Uh, I've heard it said, if you if you don't do... Acts 1 8, then 8 1 will happen. <laughs> now think about that. 1 8 is going to all the world, you know, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And this is going to be a fulfillment of that prophecy. Philip will go into Samaria. And it's they're spread out because persecution after the death of Stephen hit. But uh, notice that the persecution came, Acts 8 1, because they did not go out. Acts 1 8. So I think that's a little, a little clever ditty, and it kind of explains what's going to happen tonight. Now, the next couple of weeks, tomorrow, the next time is going to be the tremendous account of Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road, and then the theologically significant Cornelius event in Acts 10, a Roman soldier. So, what we're recording in Acts by using the personalities is the gospel overcoming geographical and racial barriers. And tonight, the Samaritans were a huge racial barrier for Jewish people. And we will talk about that as we get into the text. So let's look at the text if we could. Notice it says, uh, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting them to death. Now, Saul, of course, we talked before, it looks like that most Jewish families outside of Palestine name their children with a Greek name and with a Hebrew name. So it may have been that Paul always had two names, Saul and Paul. It may have been that he took this name, which means little, because he's going to be a persecutor of the church. And I wanted to read, if I could, just for a minute, if you have your Bibles there, if you go to Acts 26.10, you kind of see how bad things really got, Acts 26.10. Um, <clears throat> and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. Oh, my goodness. You mean Paul not only tore up families and imprisoned them, but Paul was actively involved in the murder of Christians? Yes. And there are several texts like that. If you look in your notes, I've listed a, a series of texts where, where Paul was so ashamed of his early years. I've often said, if God can have mercy on a man like Saul of Tarsus, uh, God can have mercy on you. And you may say, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know what Paul did. And here we have a, a wonderful, wonderful example of the grace of God. Now, it's not, a, it's not going to be a typical example because I don't think Paul had a whole lot of choice blind there on the road to Damascus in chapter 9. But it is an example of the grace of God overpowering. And then this chapter, and I hope you sense this, this is another amazing um, example of the grace of God. Samaritans were included, and that shocked everybody, even though it was predicted in Acts 1.8. Now, I just wanted to, do a, to assume here a couple of things. When it says, I raised my hand and voted against them, uh, that 26.10, there's, there's two possibilities of theological implications I want to bring to that. Number one, that implies that Paul may have been a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, that would have been where the vote took place. The only other option is in a local synagogue. And uh, it doesn't seem that this is a local thing, but, but a major national thing he participated in. The second thing, if Paul was a member of the synagogue, he had to be married. So I think Paul was married, and I think his wife left him when he became a Christian. So um, here we have a person who was certainly damaged by his previous life in several ways, and yet God wonderfully used him. I often, just as a side note, I want to say to you, I think that at least in my denomination, divorce has become the unpardonable sin. 
But I want I want you to know that God uses the idea of divorce in the Old Testament where a Levitical priest whose wife was unfaithful, he, he, God demanded that he divorce that wife. And God often uses the example of, of God himself divorcing Israel because of their spiritual unfaithfulness. So I would say to you, I'm not trying to say divorce is not a problem. I'm just trying to say it's not the unpardonable sin. And sometimes we've made it that because of our proof texting of certain examples in 1 Timothy 3, for example. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention here is um, that's almost like a little separate paragraph to itself. You notice that's how the New American Standard breaks it off. Then beginning in the second part of chapter one, on that day, great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Now, I have mentioned to you, and I hope you'll think about it, that in the gospel of Luke, it's the Pharisees who are the problem. But in Acts, it's the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees would have been mad because Paul broke some of the traditions, the oral traditions. But the Sadducees were mad because it, Jesus claimed to be the new temple and he depreciated the place of sacrifices and he kicked over the tables of the money changers in the temp in the Gentile part of the temple. So the Sadducees were mad about that and they're the ones that are gonna try to kill him in Acts uh, against the Christians in Acts as the Pharisees were against. And the Sadducees too were against Jesus, but most of the gospel is the Pharisees. I notice if you would, that they're mad about a couple of things. Number one, the growing popularity. Now, think for a minute. Here are these people who have purchased the rights to sell things in the temple from the Romans. And now thousands of Levitical priests are being saved. Now, that really threatened these Sadducees. They were Levitical priests of a certain family, not Aaron's, but they were in control. And now thousands of their fellow priests were being converted. And not only that, but there was a huge popularity among the people of the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, this may go back again to one of Luke's purposes in writing Acts, and that was to show that the church was not a threat to the Roman authorities or to a Jewish community. And I think that may be one of the purposes of Luke's writing, especially when he Paul defends himself before some of these Jewish leaders and as he defends himself before some of the Roman officials also. Now, the second paragraph of that is the word church, and uh, this, of course, is the word ecclesia. I've kind of asked Charlie to click on that just for a moment. Um, these special topics are meant to expand the discussion of these terms. And I have a, a very sincere opinion about the use of the term ecclesia. Now, in, it can mean a town meeting, as it does in one chapter in Acts, just a secular use. But in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there is a famous phrase called the Congregation of Israel or the Assembly of Israel. And uh, this is where the uh, Koine Greek translators of the Hebrew text use this term to translate that unique word kahal used for Israel. I think these early Christians saw themselves not as an appendage or a plan B or an offshoot. They saw themselves as a legitimate fulfillment of the Old Testament people of God. And I, I think that shows you that the focus of the church is not some parenthesis in history because the Jews didn't accept. The church is the very purpose of, of the Old Testament. The, the church is the fulfillment. And I, I certainly feel that. And I've given you all the references that I've can there. And of course, my purpose in doing this is to show you the different aspects of the use of a term and to give you the scripture references so you can check me. And really the goal of myself as a teacher is to get you back in the Bible and not just to hear me or agree with me or whatever. So that that's the purpose of that. And this, if you want to see Acts 738, that's where Stephen uses the word ecclesia uh, to describe it, the Old Testament covenant people. And he, he calls them the assembly in the wilderness. But that, of course, is talking about the Jewish community as it came out of Egypt. So I, I think that's powerful there. Now, Luke is very fond of the word great, mega. And you wonder why, but he uses it. I think I, I made in my notes of a shock when I saw this again, 25 times in the gospel and 29 times in Acts, <laughs> which means it almost loses its effect when you use great that much. But just in Acts 8, look at this. Great persecution, verse 1. Great lamentation, verse 2. 
great voice, verse 7, someone great, verse 9, to the greatest, verse 10, and great miracles, verse 13. So, boy, he likes this word, and it's used over and over. Now, notice if you would here it says, and they were all scattered throughout the region except the apostles. Now, that's really interesting to me. It looks to say that that the particularly the Greek speaking church. Now, there's been some books and academic circles that there was an underlying uh, jealousy between the Aramaic speaking Jews and these ones who had come back in their later life to live in Palestine, but they spoke Greek. There were synagogues for Greek speaking Jews and there were synagogues for Aramaic speaking people. And there was some jealousy there. Now we see that in how the widows felt like one group was getting more food than the other. Is that the reason that, that, that we have this apostles were accepted because they spoke Aramaic, but the seven were not accepted because apparently they had Greek names and apparently they were Greek speaking Jews. I think that's reading too much into this. I prefer to go a different direction. I think for all the apostles heard about the teachings of Jesus, they were still surprised so many times in relation to what he said was going to happen. But these Greeks speaking, the seven, and back in chapter six, they caught the full implication of the great commission of Matthew 28, of Luke 24, and they caught the implications of Acts 1.8 when the apostles didn't. So the apostles seemed to be safe from the persecution in the city of Jerusalem, but the, some of these other Christians, particularly the seven, had to spread out. And notice, as they spread out, they spread the word of God. These are wonderful, powerful uh, early church leaders. Uh, Acts 6 is not deacons. The, this is a unique group, the seven. And I, I think they went out and it's amazing what they, they could accomplish. Now, notice where it says, scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, that's exact fulfillment of Acts 1-8. But notice it's not the apostles. It's this other group of the seven. It's been my experience that sometimes church leadership just does not get the big picture. Sometimes they just don't see the full implications of some of these texts. And it's people in the church who take the Bible seriously and trust what God is trying to do that somehow pushes churches to be what they're called to be. And I, I think that's what we have here. I put in my notes, the church is still reluctant to go. And sometimes Acts 1-8 occurs because Acts 8-1 Acts occurs because Acts 1-8 doesn't occur. Um, notice if you would then, and some devout men buried Stephen. Now this word devout, it's used of spiritual minded Jews. You might want to see how it's used in Luke 2.25. Here it seems to be that the Mishnah uh, said you cannot, you cannot grieve over those who have blasphemed. If they're stoned to death because of blasphemy, you can't grieve over them. Now, probably this goes back to some of the comments uh, in Leviticus about the death of Aaron's two sons who uh, gave an uh, unofficial offering, and but he, Aaron's not allowed to grieve over them. That may be some of the hints here. But these devout men, they're going to loudly, greatly lament over the death because of what? Well, either they saw what happened they don't think was fair, official, or it's an attitude of defiance against this, against this militarism that developed early from the Sadducees and their followers. Now, which it is, I'm not sure, but, but I think either one fits the text well. Okay, then verse 3. Uh, Saul began ravaging the church. Now, this, this began ravaging. This is an imperfect tense in Greek. Now, it has two implications. The beginning of the act are the reoccurrence of an act. Now, both of those will fit contextually here. This is when Saul, after the death of Stephen, began to persecute the church. Now, many of us think that, have, have you ever known the psychological thing that if somebody uh, doesn't want to do something, they tend to go overboard in other areas? It almost looks like to me that Saul is, is just cut to the quick with Stephen's message. And to overcome that internal guilt and, and uh, pain, he's going to even be more aggressive against the church. And that's, that, of course, he may just have wanted to commend himself to the uh, Sadducees as a gung-ho Pharisee. I'm not sure. But 
he, this is where he begins, and, and it is it is terrible. Uh, the term ravage means the tearing of a body by an animal. Now, it's used sometimes in Exodus for sacrifices that are torn apart to make themselves acceptable. Other time, it's used of shepherds having to bring pieces of a, a, an animal, a sheep, killed by a wild animal to prove it really wasn't stolen. It really was killed by an animal. So it is a very strong, vicious term. Um, <clears throat> I've listed in your notes several of the text in Acts. You can see them there. And even in 1 Corinthians 15 and Galatians 1, Philippians 3, 1 Timothy, where Paul mentions his early, his early terrible ravaging of the church. And um, I think, man, if God can have mercy on him and use him to be an apostle of the Gentiles, all of us have hope in the grace of God. Now, entering house to house, there are two possibilities here. They may have, they may have watched the apostles and made notes of when they went house to house, teaching, preaching, and breaking bread. We saw that earlier. So they made a note of those houses that were Christian. It may have been that what we're talking about him is they're going house to house, is that this talking about a house church. They found out where the Christians were meeting on the, on the Lord's day on Sunday, and they attacked that house. Either one is possible here. Now, these early Christians, I want to remind you that the, there was no separation between the synagogue and the church until about A.D. 90, after the fall of the temple and the Pharisaic reform in Jamnia and the 18 benedictions, the curse formulas to keep Christians out of the synagogue. Until then, they met together. So these early Christians would meet on the Sabbath in the synagogue on Sunday with a local group of believers. They would attend the temple on feast days and maybe even special teaching times. And they would ha have special locations. First Corinthians 11 talks about a large gathering of all the house churches in Corinth in some location. So they were involved in many, many meetings during the week about, about their faith. Some were Jewish oriented and some were Christian oriented. Now when it says dragging off men and women, this word dragging off, is used in Revelation 12, 4 for Satan knocking a third of the stars from heaven. So this is a very, very strong term. And notice they were dragging off men and women. Now, this is saying what Paul did. He broke into homes and he separated families. I mean, this was tragic. A little later on, when they preached the word, it says men and women both accepted, which I think is a purposeful contrast. Here is Saul tearing up homes, dividing men and women. But here's the gospel. Men and women are both baptized when they receive the gospel. So I think there is a play on those two words together. Um, let's look at the next paragraph, verses four through eight. Those who had been scattered about went, went preaching the word. Now, the curse, the word preaching, uh, the Greek word, it, one of them is kerygma, and it basically means that which is preached or the message which is preached. There is a special topic. Would you click on that, Charlie, the kerygma of the early church? And I told you when I began this study of Acts that the reason I wanted to do it is because people keep asking me, what are the basics of Christianity? There are so many different opinions about what is absolutely crucial and what is peripheral. We say in essentials, unity and peripherals, freedom. But who has determined what's essential and what's peripheral? Well, for me, at least part of it, not, not completely, because there are some doctrines left out. But when, when I see what the apostles, what Peter, the leader of the apostolic group, what Stephen, Acts 7, and what Paul preaching to different groups, what they said about Jesus looks like to me to be the historical content of what we call the gospel. Now, it is true there are some aspects of the gospel not mentioned here. Substitutionary atonement is not a big aspect of this. Uh, heaven and hell are not aspects of this. So it's not like every Christian doctrine is included, but these are the major ones. And I try to list them for you and then give you every place in Acts where they're used so you can see uh, exactly how uh, the, these uh, main topics. So I would say, if I'm going to say who is a false teacher, it's not somebody who disagrees with me or a different denomination or something or a different experience, but do they agree with these basic theological content about the, pers the person of Jesus, the person of God, how somebody is right with God. These are the things that hold us together. 
And there is another special topic found in the pastorals called the orthodoxy of the pastorals, where again, th these types of basic truths are set out and anyone who disagrees with apostolic truth is called a false teacher. Okay, notice if you would then where it says the word. Now the word word here, this is the word logos and uh, it can be used in several ways. Um, the word of God seems to be parallel to the gospel in context here. Now, when we talk about the word, there's different ways to look at it. You have the spoken word of God. This is things like creation or God's special uh, uh, word to Abraham, stuff like that. Then you have the written word of God, which would be the Old Testament and then and the new, of course. And then you have the living word of God, which would be the son of God, which is the ultimate revelation of God. Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus said that aren't recorded. There's a lot of things that God said to people that aren't recorded. So what we have to say is all communication from God is the word of God. We have some of it recorded and we have the ultimate in Jesus the uh, Christ, the Messiah. Okay, with that in mind, um, the word here must surely refer to the gospel, but also added the worldwide non-Jewish focus of Stephen. And the reason I say that, this is what's going to cause the trouble. These seven are going to start preaching to Gentiles. They're going to start preaching to the hated Samaritans. They're going to even pre preach to Roman uh, army officers, what Peter's going to be forced into. This gospel is breaking down every barrier that human beings put up. And what we have here is the wonderful truth about that. And um, man, what a powerful text this is. Now, Philip, one of the seven. Now, they, there are three evangelistic settings connected with Philip. Number one is the Samaritans. Now, I'm going to get into that in just a minute. They were hated by the Jews. The Jews called them half-breeds. The Jews of Jesus' day called them dogs. That's when Jesus plays on the dogs with that woman of Phoenicia. But also, the Jews would say that God just created Samaritans to keep the fires of hell burning. Now think about that. They would say, if, if a Samaritan is having a baby, you can't help him. If you walk through Samaria, you had to knock the dust off your feet before you entered uh, Judea. That's the kind of hatred they had. And then you have the Ethiopian eunuch. Oh my goodness. Now here is a, this man may have been a proselyte and it may go back to the queen of Sheba taking home the gospel back in Solomon's day. But uh, these would be a racially different people. This would be a wealthy man. And here we have some of these prejudices. The barriers are coming down. And then finally, on the way home, Philip's going to preach in the coastal area of Samaria. Now, friends, this is the Philistine cities. You talk about another hated group of people is the Philistine. This is their descendants. And the gospel is overcoming these major racial hatreds. One by one, these blocks are falling. And it's this special sign of Pentecost that's showing the Jewish believers that God has accepted a new group. This, this is very purposeful planning. And it goes back to the geographical and racial dispersion of the good news. And that being the will of God. So Philip is really a great guy. And uh, boy, we, a lot of things are said about him. He went down, now look in your Bible, if you will, depending on what translation you have, you look at and see in my notes, to the city of Samaria. There's a real problem with the word, the city of Samaria. Some manuscripts have the definite article, some do not. I'm not going to get into textual criticism really deep with you. If you want to see my special topic on textual criticism, you can look it up later. But what we have here is, in this day and time, the city of Samaria, Samaria was not called Samaria. The Romans had changed its name. And if it's the city, the major city, is probably Shechem. And there's even another theory that it may be the city of, um, let's see if I can spell it right here, G-I-T-T-A, which was the home city of Simon Magnus, who we're also going to talk about in this section. So we're not sure what city, but this is typical of some of these historical events. To say I'm not sure of what city it is doesn't deny the reality of the text at all. It just means of how much we don't know when we come to these ancient texts as far as specificity. Like, should it be the city of Samaria or a city of Samaria? In my opinion, that doesn't do any damage to the trustworthiness of the gospel. And begin claiming the Messiah to them. Now, 
The trick is, in 722 BC, as you know, the Assyrians took over the northern ten tribes of Israel, captured Samaria after a several-year uh, siege, and they deported many, many, most of the Jews to Mesopotamia. And in their place, they settled other people. Now, I think the place you can, if you want to see all this, it's 2 Kings 17, 24 through 41. You're all going to see some of this problem in uh, um, Ezra 4, 1 through 3. So these are, they considered them half-breeds. And when the Jews were allowed to come back to Judea under Cyrus II's edict of 538 BC, these groups opposed the Jews coming back opposed the Jews rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So there was some hatred there, and it had lasted through generations. So for these people to be preached to, and they responding was a major theological shock to these traditional Jewish people. Now, Jesus had earlier been through Samaria, and the, the text even says, I must, Dia, I must go through Samaria. There was a divine appointment at the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And, and the city came out and listened. So it's not just one a Samaritan woman. It's the whole city that responded well. And the disciples were totally shocked. Well, the same kind of thing is happening here. They hear the gospel and they respond to it. So the new age of the spirit has come. Acts 1, 8 is being fulfilled, even with all the prejudice involved. Now, the crowds with one accord. Now, one accord is a very popular phrase for Luke. He uses it in the gospel. He uses it in Acts. He's trying to say there was some kind of sense of, of um, purposeful unity, not only in persecution, but again in the church. And so it's used over and over. Uh, as they heard and saw the signs which were being performed. Now, apparently, the miraculous element of confirmation of this radically new message about God was confirmed by signs and wonders. Now, there were traveling people in the ancient world that did signs and wonders. So the first thing you got to say is there are others claiming to do this. The, the Jews had exorcists. The Jews had traveling healers. But here we have these who are preaching the gospel. Signs and wonders are accompanying them. Now, remember, Jesus did that. The apostles did that. The 70 did that. The seven do that. Paul is going to do that. So what we have here is God confirming. Now, people often say to me, well, Bob, why don't we see the same power and miraculous events in the church today that we see in Acts? Well, I do believe, first of all, that these miraculous events are still occurring, particularly in areas of the world where the gospel is new. This was God's way of confirming the, the radical newness, truthfulness, and compassion of the gospel. Now, I think in America or Western Europe, I think people here have so many opportunities to hear the gospel that just a miraculous event would, would not impress them. As a matter of fact, I want to remind you that in Matthew 24, 24, and other places you can see in your reference Bible in the margin, there are those in the last days are false teachers who'll do signs and wonders. So the miraculous is not automatically a sign of God. So I do not think we ought to seek the miraculous. We ought to seek faith in Jesus. And if, if, if the miraculous comes, I still believe he heals. I still believe Jesus does this. Now, why he does it this time and not another time, I can't answer that. But I still believe that these signs are still in effect. So I am not a cessationist. I believe all the gifts are still functioning. I just don't know exactly how to define them and why they occur here or there or this time or that time. That, that's just a mystery to me. Sorry. Um, now, if, if you notice, I want to go a little further. Let's see. And they heard and saw the signs that were being performed. So that, that um, miracles confirmed Philip's message. That's Acts 8, uh, verse 7. In the same manifestation, the Spirit occurs to, to Jesus, the 12, the 70, and the 7. Um, now, demon possession. This is going to take me just a minute. So... <clears throat> Now, brothers and sisters, since I believe the Bible, I, my worldview is a biblical worldview. Now, in the modern scientific era, era, we try to explain all this by psychological dissidents of some kind or um, split personalities or 
I'm not exactly sure how to answer all that except this. In the New Testament, there is a clear distinction between demon possession and physical illness. I mean, every time it, it makes a distinction between the demonic and some kind of a physical uh, or emotional illness. So I, I think there is a difference. Um, it looks to me like that most of the talk I hear among Christians is about demon possession. Now, I really don't believe that a, a demon can possess a believer in the sense of taking control. But can, can the demonic damage a believer? Absolutely. We've all seen that. Um, I wish I knew more about how to identify the demonic. I have so little information in the Bible. As a matter of fact, exorcism is not listed in one of the gifts in those four different passages, and it's not even talked about much after Acts. So I wish I had more information. But through the years, uh, as a pastor, sometimes you just get involved in, in this thing. I want to give you a couple of books that have been very helpful to me because there's so many bad, crazy books in this area. Maybe it at least will give you a direction. Now, would you look at me for a minute? I hope to God you never have to buy and read these books. Let's, let's pray you never have to deal with this. But if you do, a child, a family member, a neighbor, a church member, a, a mission trip, if you do, I'd like to recommend some books. Now, to me, the book that has been the most encouraging is a book by a German evangelist. His name is Coach, K-O-U-C-H, and it's called Christian Counseling and the Occult. And he will try every example to show you where it's something natural. And when it's not, he'll turn to a possible supernatural origin. There was a wonderful professor at Dallas Seminary that when he wrote on this, I think he was fired because he began to write on this subject. His name is Merle Unger. You may know that name from other uh, reference books that he wrote, but he has he has written uh, Demons in the World Today, and I, see, I forgot the name of his second book. I think I see that Charlie has highlighted those books, uh, Biblical Demonology and Demons in the World Today. Now, these two special topics right below that, the one on exorcism is where I, I mentioned some more of these books. So if you'll click on exorcism just for a minute, Charlie. What I try to do when I go through this is to give you at least somebody who has been in the church over 50 years and had to work on a lot of mission trips. I want to try to give you as best I can the information that I've come across. So I am I'm expressing to you the reality of the demonic. What bothers me is when every problem in the Christian life is turned into a demon. Um, I, I think that's unfortunate. But here are the good books that I've listed for you that I think are helpful for me. And so I hope I hope you'll look at these. Now, it's interesting to me that a man, a Jewish convert named Alfred Edersheim, wrote a book, as you see it up a little earlier, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And in the appendix, verse 13, is the best discussion of this, how Jesus differed from the rabbis on this subject. It has proven to be a very fruitful area for me to try to understand what was going on in that day. So I, I commend that book to you. The other special topic called demons is just where I try to, to deal with the demonic that's mentioned in the Bible. There's Old Testament demons that are named. There's New Testament demons that show up here and there. And you can see that I, I basically say that this is this whole idea, some of it developed during the Zoroastrian period, and the rabbis got influenced by a dualism instead of a monotheism. And some of that carryover is in the Mishnah and the Talmud. So you can see my discussion. See, it's under angels and demons. But I do try to give you a broader picture of this. If you're interested and you have time, I hope you'll look at these two special topics. And if you have a need, I hope you'll get one or two of these books and look through them. I'm not trying to make anybody fearful. I think I've told you that I do have a personal fear in this area and, and how often in, the, in some of the dreams I have... Um, I become afraid, and uh, I have had such peace through these years of just mentioning the name of Jesus, and I'm, I'm almost, I just get real victory in the name of Jesus, man, and if you're having a problem in this area, the best I know is call on him who died for you, call on him who's overcome every demonic power there is and leads them in a train, and call on him, and he won't leave you. Now, I don't know how he's going to set you free in this area, but he he is the victor, and we don't have to fear. I love Martin Luther's, one little word shall fail him. And that little word's Jesus, my friend. So if you're struggling with this, and I hope you're not, 
I've given you the books and the information and, and maybe you can pursue that. Okay, let me get my thoughts and emotions back together. Uh, the next paragraph is verse 9 through 13. Now, Simeon, there's been a lot of fight among theologians whether he really believed or he is just a trick. Well, I, I want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, um, but there is some doubt, and it's textual doubt here. Now, first, let's talk about he believed. That's what it says, he believed. But you do realize that the word pistuo, or even pistis, the noun, pistuo, the verb, is used in the New Testament in different ways. The one that always shocks me is the John 8. Uh, there's a group of Jews who the Bible said, I believe it's 831, it says they believed in Jesus. Now that is the same form of everybody else in the New Testament. But as you read through the text, they begin to, to say something about Jesus says, Abraham is my father. And they say, no, he's not. And at the end, they try to pick up stones to stone him. So obviously, belief can be used of what is not true belief. And the other place I think about this is the parable of the soils occurring both in Matthew and Luke. And you've got, the, you know, the four soils and the seed is the gospel. Uh, of the four soils, three germinate. And one of them says they received the word with joy and then they fell away. And the only way you know a true believer from a false profession is the fruit bearing, not how much they bear, but that they bear fruit. So I think the word believe must be interpreted in context. Now, so is this guy truly uh, believing? I don't know. You know, he's a, he's a magician. He's used to manipulating people. He saw what Peter did by laying on his hands and he tried to purchase that. And boy, <laughs> he gets the hammer dropped on him. Uh, but <clears throat> at the end, he comes back and says, when Peter curses him, he says, please pray for me. Now that sounds like someone who's afraid. I, I've met some really squirrely new believers. I've met some strange new believers. I've met new believers with strange theology. But since I think salvation is a repentant faith relationship with a God who wants to know us and who's willing to work with our problems and our faults, which one of us have good theology? Which one of us have completely lived the Christian life? I'm just cutting Simon some slack and I'm hoping he's there. Now, he may not be and I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over it, but the early church turned him into a real devil. I'm not sure that's that's fair. I want to talk about magic for a minute. Now, there's, first of all, what is magic? Well, magic seems to be the attempt to know the future and affect the future for my benefit based on supernatural visions of natural things. Now, that can be the formation of clouds, the flight of birds, looking at a sheep's liver, throwing sticks on the ground, uh, picking out stones, yes or no, to questions. And there are all kinds of ways that people have tried to know the future apart from God. And therein is the problem. Look at Deuteronomy 18, where all of that is condemned. So this man was known. He had wowed people. And when he heard the gospel and saw what was happening, he was wowed. And so I think he's going he's gonna to respond. Uh, this man is what is called the great power of God. Now, this little phrase in Aramaic would seem to imply he was doing this in the name of Zeus, maybe, or some kind of magical power. Now, was he a charlatan or is he a wizard? I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, notice where it says he believed, and I've tried to deal with that, preaching of the good news. Now, this is the, the word euangelizo, which is made up the word you, good, and the word um, and angelizo, which, of course, the angel comes from that. Angels are messengers. The same thing is true in Hebrew of Malik. So what we have here is this idea of good news, and that would be another way of talking about the gospel. It usually comes into English as evangelize or ev evangel, uh, that kind of uh, word meaning. I think the first time it's used is in Mark 1 something, and I've done a word study online if you're interested in that. Now, the kingdom of God. Um, this is the subject, of course, of all of Jesus' preaching, his first sermon, his last sermon, his parables. Uh, it's somewhat hard to talk about for this reason. Uh, in, in 
it's called the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, depending on what gospel you're in. I think the best thing, at least in my understanding, is the Lord's Prayer of Matthew 6. I think it's verse 10, where it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what that's praying for is God's reign on earth. And that's what the kingdom of God is. It's a king with a reign. And so the kingdom of God, unfortunately, in the New Testament, there are two comings of Christ, not one. So the kingdom has been inaugurated, but the kingdom has not been consummated. And the time between these two is what the Bible calls the last days, the latter days, the last times. Now, if you want to see my special topic on this, it's the two ages. And this is not an Old Testament revelation, but it is interbiblical. And Jesus picks up on it. And I've given you all the verses, both in the Gospels and Paul and in Hebrews, where this two age, the already but the not yet, is talked about. Now, the name of Christ, if you notice there, I've got two special topics, the name of the Lord, and that should be, should not be all caps Lord, it should be little O-R-D, because we're talking about curios here, and the same is true of Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus as Lord, should be a little O, little R, little D, curios. Now, these two special topics try to show you that the name represents the character, and there's a lot of biblical imagery connected to the name. We pray the name. We call on the name. We call the name of Jesus over the demonic. So I, I, if you're interested in the power of the name, uh, I hope you'll look at these two special topics later. I think they'll be informative for you. Uh, they were being baptized. Now, again, baptism is a it, it's a radical break with the past. This would be uh, shocking for Jewish people. And I'm sure it's pretty shocking for Gentile people, too. So again, I've done that special topic on baptism where I try to talk about it. It's interesting to me, people I meet in the church and they say to me, well, do you have to be baptized to be saved? And do you have to be baptized in the right formula? Or do you have to be baptized in a certain way, running water three times? I think it's ridiculous for us to fight over the how and when and who does it. I think the key is the believing heart. Now, if, if, this, some of the things that we ask, New Testament people would never ask. Somebody says, well, do I have to be baptized? Listen, my friend, if Jesus was baptized and Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples and baptize them, and the early church baptized all new believers, why in the world would you ask me a question, do I have to be baptized? Mate, let me ask you a question. Why not? Now, if we're into the fight over infant baptism versus adult baptism, then we got us some nuances we got to talk about. Baptism in the early church was, I think, the occasion for a public profession of faith. I believe the early church required of the recipient of baptism that they say, I believe Jesus is Lord. There are several texts that seem to say Jesus is Lord is a theological affirmation of both his deity and his humanity, as well as his lordship over your life. So, yes, I, I think baptism is a crucial marker. Have you read Romans 6 lately again? So don't be asking me what's the least I can do. No, no. Let's talk about what the most you ought to do. Let's talk about what the biblical thing you ought to do, and that is be baptized. Now, if you want to argue over when, how, and what method, and what, what formula, we can talk about that. But baptism is significant. It's biblical, and I think it's a marker for a brand new life, old man, new man, old creature, new creature. So I'm, <laughs> I'm over it now. And that's not the Baptist in me that's talking. That's the Bible teacher in me that's talking. By the way, Baptists are weak on baptism. We say, wait a minute, we don't want to heat the water up. Let's get four or five. Now, you don't have to do it right now. You can wait. Friend, I want to tell you, New Testament folks, you were baptized when you were saved. What about the Philippian jailer? What, what about what about this eunuch? Friends, don't, <laughs> we say, well, it doesn't really matter. When you get around to it, we'll, we'll do it on a special holiday. Friends, it's, we just get these traditions from our, from our forefathers in our mind, and they become as important as Scripture. Look at the Bible. Check the Bible in every denominational tradition you have. But I can tell you this right now. If you start kicking at those traditions, just be prepared to get a kickback. Because there is a reaction. People feel so comfortable in what somebody they love have always told them, and they never check the Bible at all. Amen or oh me? Okay. <clears throat> uh, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Now, there's that. 
Paul, uh, Saul, Paul is persecuting men and women, dragging them off to prison. But here, when the gospel is preached, there's no distinction between men and women. I want to tell you, Jesus has raised the place of women and the place of children to a place of importance. He, went, he so went against his own culture in doing that. Jesus cared for people society didn't care for. That ought to say something to us. And so there's a real hair pull among churches today about women leadership. I hope, I hope that you will look at my special topic on women in the Bible and women in ministry and women that helped Paul and women that traveled with Jesus in my special topics. Because I think we in our day, because of our commitment to a literal interpretation of patriarchal scripture text have missed the radical newness of the gospel where there is no more male or female, slave or free, Jew or Greek. We're all free in Christ. And to put those bonds back on, in my opinion, is a misguided literalism and legalism. And I'm over it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Simon believed. There again in verse 13, we have that. And um, you hope you see the full note at chapter 12. Uh, and he continued with Philip. Now, I've made a note here. Look at my notes online. Notice the sequence of these events. He heard. He saw the miracles. He believed. He was baptized. And he wanted to stay with Philip. Now, all of that looks like the mark of a believer to me. Is it a new believer? Yes. Are new believers strange? Yes. Does God bend over backwards to work with new believers? Yes. I hope Simon's there. I hope I see him. <laughs> um, now, the next paragraph is a little bit longer, verses 14 through 24. Um, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. Now, first of all, notice that the baptism was done by Philip. And he didn't have to write back to the apostles in Jerusalem to get a, a permission. You know, I, I've had so much flack in my own denomination by saying you've got to get permission from the church to baptize somebody. Where in the world do you get that? You get it from tradition. Philip didn't get any permission from anybody to baptize these people. If you're a believer and you want to be baptized, whether you're an Ethiopian eunuch or men and women who just respond, any believer can baptize any believer in Jesus' name. We get so locked up in this stuff. We split churches over this stuff. It's amazing to me. Now, notice where it mentions here, he received the word. I am an evangelical Christian. I believe you must receive. I've been, uh, in my later life, I've been calling it an aha moment. Now, you can be a special topic down there. Don't click on it, uh, Charlie. But you see, what, what does it mean to receive, believe, confess, profess, and call upon? There are two special topics there. One is where I give you all the verses about when it says receive, we must receive the gospel. That's, that's the free will part. That's the covenant part of humanity, fallen humanity. But I want to tell you, we get so locked in that this is the only way to do it. You got to pray a sinner's prayer. There is no sinner's prayer in the New Testament. You got to have these feelings. It doesn't say that. You got to have this experience speaking in tongues. It doesn't say that. Friends, we, we, we stick these scriptures together that never talk about the same thing, and they become dogmatic traditions that we pass on. These folks believed. They received. What does that mean? They said yes. Now, how do they do that? Well, in my experience, it can happen a million ways. It can happen during a song. It can happen during an invitation. It can happen at, at the deathbed uh, of a friend. Uh, it can happen in the park. Uh, where is not the issue? The certain words are not the issue. I'm not a sacramentalist. But the heart is the key. Is there a sense of need? Is there a sense of information about Jesus? Is there a sense of wanting to know God? This is the key here. And the how, when, where, who, and why, I think we can talk about. But it becomes so dogmatic. I hope you'll think through your own traditions in this area. But I do think we must personally respond. John 1, 12. John 3, 16. Romans 10, 9 through 13. And all these texts would receive. These two special topics I hope will be interesting to you. That first one I did after working in Eastern Europe for years with these people. And they would say to me, I've loved Jesus all my life. 
And I would say, have you ever prayed a sinner's prayer? And they said, no, I never heard of that. And I would say, well, you need to do this. And then it got to me. How arrogant am I to tell this person who's loved Jesus all their life that unless they do it the way I did it, they're not in? Holy spit, that is really bad. Okay, okay. Well, I see it's about our time to take a break and I'll, <laughs> I'll get my little emotions and excitement under control and I'll see you in about five minutes or so, okay? Shalom. I'd like to come back, if we could, to this idea about um, <clears throat> verse 15. Well, wait a minute. The apostles from Jerusalem. Uh, why do you think uh, the apostles needed to come? Do you think it was because the Samaritans were so hated there has to be a special movement of the apostles, particularly the leadership like Peter and John? Peter's obviously the spokesman for the group. John had earlier in his life, along with his brother, called, wanted to call down fire on these very people because they wouldn't do this or that in the Jewish way. So I think they came to confirm this. And I think it's theologically, it was to show they were still the the, the leaders of the group, not the seven, but the apostles. Now, also, when we come to this, they prayed to them. I think they're looking for another, what, what I want to call a Samaritan Pentecost. Now, why? Now, think of me for a minute. We, this is a little controversial. I really believe that whatever the Pentecostal event were, the tongues of fire, the speaking or hearing in other languages, whatever that was, was a, a way to communicate the gospel. Uh, they all, those people from around the world, heard the gospel in their own language. I think it's a miracle, the ear more than the tongue, but they all heard. And there were supernatural manifestations of that, a lights and wind and all of that. This same thing is going to occur several times. For what purpose? Well, theologically, it shows these new Jewish believers that God has included another racial or geographical group. And so, and you got to think through what I'm saying, just see if you agree with me. I really believe that the tongues of Acts are not the same as the tongues of Corinth. That's the same Greek word, uh, but it's just different. And how is it different? You don't need a matching spiritual gift of interpreter in Acts, but you do need a matching spiritual gift of interpreter in Corinth. Now, Corinth was a, a major seaport for Rome, uh, for the city of Corinth. So every language in the world was there. So you would you could get a, tra a, a, a just a translator. You don't need a translator. You need a spiritual gift of interpreting. So I think they're different. You can see my special topic on speaking in tongues, where I try to lay this out as best I can. Whether you agree or disagree with me, we're looking for a supernatural confirmation that God accepted half-breed Jews, Samaritans, and that they are fully included with all the racial baggage that Hebrews would have brought to this. And I think that's what we're talking about this here. One more point, and I, I enter this somewhat reluctantly, and, and I want to do a little disclaimer with you first. So while I'm talking, will you get your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 12 with me for a minute? And I want to go over to uh, verses uh, 39 starting in 28 and 39 and 40. What often happens in a discussion of tongues like this is, well, the apostles came and laid hands on them. Friends, you, they couldn't be saved without the Holy Spirit, right? You just can't be saved. They can't believe without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Philip has already had signs and wonders that the Holy Spirit performed through him. So to say they don't have the Spirit until the apostles come can't be true. So it's got to be something else. Now, there are groups, and you know, whenever I seem to talk negative about charismatics, I hope you'll let me clarify it. I think charismatics have a wonderful sense of the presence of God. They have a joy and a peace that many times I don't find in legalistic evangelical groups. Thank God for the charismatic movement. Thank God for charismatic Catholics. Thank God for people who have a sense of the presence of God and expect something to happen every day. I want to be in that group. 
But like all of us, we carry some theological baggage from our ancestors. And to say that you have to speak in tongues as the evidence that you are truly Christian just doesn't make sense biblically. There were no tongues speaking in Acts 2.38. Well, this is the only time that laying on of hands and speaking in tongues is mentioned in all of the conversions in Acts. So to say this is the standard model does not see Acts as a historical narrative recording what did happen, not what should happen every time. And on top of that, beginning in this text in 1 Corinthians 12, and this is a Greek grammar issue, not a Bob's opinion issue. Now, if you'll notice here where it talks about he's appointed these leaders in the church and he lists all those same as, as Ephesians 4. And then in 29, he says, not all are apostles, are they? Now, in Koine Greek, there are two particles that tell you it's a question and I expect a yes answer and it's a question and I expect a no answer. Now, this has the may particle and it, it must be translated. Not all are apostles, are they? Of course they're not. Not all are prophets, are they? No. Not all are teachers, are they? No. Not all are workers of miracles, are they? No. By the way, that means there are workers of miracles. So those of you who are nervous about that, get over it. It's in the text here. Just everybody's not. All do not have the gift of healing, do they? There is a gift of healing. All do not speak in tongues, do they? No. All do not interpret, do they? No. Now, friends... Why are we so dogmatic about one kind of experience being the marker that you're a Christian? It looks like to me that the Christian life is the marker that claiming to trust Jesus, publicly professing him, and then living a Christ life like. Now, that's the true marker of a Christian, not some religious experience, whether it's initial or ongoing. So I hope you'll think through that. I hope you'll look at my special topic on uh, speaking in tongues. Now, um, <clears throat> Okay, let's go to verses 16 and 17. Uh, this is a different order stated in the book of Acts 2.38. The discrepancy is due to specific actions of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at my notes. Number one, in Acts 2.38, it's a relationship to salvation. In Acts 8.16, it's a relationship to the Pentecostal type experience of Acts 2. So it just you can't see Acts as setting the doctrine because it's so different in how it happens every time. I hope you'll think think through that with me. Um, Peter and John wanted a Samaritan Pentecost to clearly demonstrate that God accepted the hated Samaritans, and that's what they got. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with Cornelius in, in chapter 10. Why? He's a Roman military officer. These Jews aren't going to believe God accepted a Roman military officer. So the tongues and the Pentecostal experience is the evidence. Yes, God is here. The Spirit's here. The Spirit accepts them. We must accept them. Now, when it says, verse 20, the theological question, was he saved or lost? Peter's can be taken as a curse or a warning. Uh, I don't know how you see that. The gift of God. Now, the gift of God would stand for everything God's done for salvation. The drawing to himself, the sending of his son, the sending of his spirit. So the gift of God. I've listed you several texts where this is used in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, as well as Luke and Acts. You have no part or portion in this matter. Now, both these are powerful but things. What, what the, Peter's saying is you have no part of the Christian faith if you act like this. This is not normative. This is something we can't accept. And so these are strong words. This word portion has a negative, I mean, part has a negative connotation here in 2 Corinthians 6, 15. Now the word portion is simply the Hebrew word for lot, like the Urim and the Thummim, casting lot to know God's will. In English, we get the word clergy from this word kleros, which is this ideal of a lot. Now I want to take just a moment for a theological aside. I am appalled that evangelical Christianity has taken over the distinction between clergy and laity from the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Because I believe every time the word kleros, we get the word clergy, or laos, we get the word laity from, is used in the New Testament, it refers to all Christians, not some subset or superset of them. 
There is no clergy laity dichotomy. And I want to make it even stronger if you just let me for a minute. I believe that uh, particularly Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 makes the strong statement that every believer is a called, gifted, full-time minister, and that every believer has a part in the body of Christ for it to function actually. That's why we Paul uses the idea of a human body. Now, none of us want to be an appendix. We all want to be an eye or something. But the problem is, if you've got a bad appendix, you're dead. There's a place for every believer, every believer, no matter what age, no matter what personality. So we've got to see that it's not some elite group that do the will of God and study the Bible and pray. No, it's all of us have a part. All of us are called. All of us are gifted. All of us are full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. I reject this clergy laity dichotomy that's developed in evangelicalism into this ordination system. Ordination is only talked about in three verses of the Bible, and it never says what we say in our denominations about it. It certainly doesn't make us an elite group, a special group. It may, if anything, it makes us a servant group. I'm over it now. I knew tonight there's going to be a lot of things in here that's going to turn me off, turn me on, I guess. For the heart is not, your heart is not right with God. Now, this may be a quote from Psalm 78. It's possible. Uh, right or just is a play on the word. So when God wants to pick some word to describe himself to mankind, what does he pick? Well, he picked a straight, uh, 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 we would, in Texas, we would call it a bamboo pole. It's a very long, very straight river reed. Now, they used a plumb line for the vertical straightness to test it. But the horizontal, they used this river reed. God said, I'm like that meaning he is the standard. He is the measuring stick. And if that's true, every word for sin in Hebrew and in Greek mean a deviation from the standard. Now, the word is in, in Hebrew, we get the word right or just or justified. All of those have one root and all of them apply to this same idea that God is the standard. So his heart is not right. His heart, God's the standard. His heart is wrong. And of course, He's, he's a new believer. He's got strange ideas. Now, verse 22, repent. Now, th this grammatical form denotes urgency. I don't think you can be saved without repenting. I think repentance is an absolute crucial aspect of the new covenant. Repent and believe. Now, what we have here is that there is a, a, a turning from self and sin, Genesis 3, and there is a turning to Jesus Christ by faith. So repentance and faith involve that turning from and turning to. So repentance is crucial. And this man apparently had been attracted to the message, but maybe he had not fully repented. I just don't know. And then notice the word pray here. <clears throat> Talking to God is an evidence of a personal relationship. People often ask me, you evangelicals talk about a personal relationship with God. What do you mean? Well, I have thought about that because you know, I, I've never heard Jesus. Uh, he doesn't speak to me um, orally. My Bible doesn't float and certain verses turn gold and stuff. No, it just doesn't happen. I'm not saying it never happened to some. I just say it doesn't happen to me. So how can I say I have a personal relationship with someone that I've never seen and heard? I mean, he doesn't walk in my room and when I'm sick and touch me on the forehead. So how can I say I have a personal relationship with him? Well, when I'm hurting confused, alone, don't know what to do, sick. And I begin to talk to him as if he heard me and knows me and it's going to make a difference in my life. That's a personal relationship. And for me, that's what this is talking about. Now, the word if, it's a first class condition. Again, I want to remind you, I've got a little more time tonight, so I'll just take a little bit more. There are four classes of Greek conditional sentences and there are they are marked by a textual marker. And what they basically mean is no, the first class means that something is assumed to be true for the author's purpose. It doesn't mean it's true to reality every time, though most of the time it is, but it's true for the, for the, the person speaking's presentation. Second class is a false assertion is made to accentuate a false conclusion. Third class is potential probable action. And fourth class is a wish or a prayer. Now, 
Every time you see that if in your English translation, it's trying to communicate some of that. Now, if you want a longer discussion, you can see the Greek grammatical special topic, Roman numeral seven will document those different ifs. Now, when it says the intention of your heart, I want to say that sin begins in the thought life. And if it be, if we tend to dwell on it, it'll work itself out into our words or deeds. This is why Paul over and over says, gird up the loins of your mind. The rabbis believed that the mind was like a garden plowed and ready for seed. And what we let in through our eyes and ears falls on that plowed ground. And if we dwell on it, it'll become who we are. So we've got to gird up. You know, that's true. Y'all seen some things you wish you hadn't seen, heard some things you wish you hadn't heard. There's no way to unhear or unsee. We've got to guard our mind from these things of the world. And it's an, it's an active guarding. I, I think we've got to see that. And notice, if you will, where it says this gall of bitterness. Now, this is uh, used several times in the Old Testament. I've given you the verses there from Deuteronomy. Uh, it, it's The second one is often used for that which is bitter. Uh, I often call this, um, this is spiritual cancer. I, I've met so many Christians who are hurt and burned out and bitter. And what happens, something happens to us or we do something to somebody or circumstances come and we get a bitter spirit. Uh, I call it a spiritual cancer. And it doesn't hurt the person we're mad at, but it will destroy us. We've got to give that to God. He can handle it. We cannot. And so this bitterness has got to be, we've got to deal with it and get it away. Now, this uh, in bondage of iniquity, I mentioned in my notes, this seems to be the work of the Messiah in, Ma in Isaiah 58, 6. Now, I think this man has been delivered from his sin because I think he has believed. And now Jesus is going to deliver him from what? From this bondage to iniquity, this, this egotism of wanting power and money and fame. Jesus needs to deliver us in two ways. We need to be delivered from sin because of eternity and the power of sin in our Christian lives. Sin is a serious issue. And if it's not dealt with now, unfortunately, it has eternal consequences. But Jesus can deal with both aspects if we just give ourselves to him. I would say that the, that the salvation is a gift from God that we must receive through Christ. And I believe the Christian life is a gift from God that we must receive and continue to receive through Christ. Uh, pray to the Lord for me yourself. Now, I think Simon's saying, oh, I made a mistake. I, this, I'm sorry. Please, you pray for me. I think I, I, I just think the guy was stupid and he asked Peter to forgive him and pray for him. So you, you think what you will about him. I don't know. I notice where it, it says solemnly testified. I made a note back here. Let me look at it. Oh, yeah. The word of God, this phrase refers to, I'm going to give you, it's not in the notes, Charlie, just hold it right there. I've made a new note and let me just quickly summarize it. The word of God, this phrase refers to number one in the Old Testament refers to Yahweh's message. And I think of Genesis 15, 1, Isaiah 40, verse 8, which will never pass away. Number two, in the New Testament, it's, it refers to Jesus's words, Acts 11, 16, Acts 13, uh, 13, 12. In Acts, it also refers to the gospel about Jesus, Acts 8, 25, that's where we are, and several others. Uh, there is a specialized use of this word, logos, word, in John 1, where it refers to the Messiah himself. He is the word of God, the logos. So this, this is a pretty powerful phrase. And it's used several times. Now, on the way home, verse 25, Philip, seeing what happened with, the, with, the, with what, what's going on with him, he's going to start preaching in these Samaritan villages. <laughs> these, these are the ones that are to be in the Philistine area. Uh, he sees what happens in this one count, and it opens his eyes to what God wants to do to all of these kinds of folks. Okay, let's go to the next uh, Paragraph 26 through 40, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now, again, in the Bible, there are two uses of this phrase, the angel of the Lord. You can see that special topic there. In the Old Testament, it can refer to a messenger angel, or it can refer to the physical manifestations of Yahweh himself. And it depends on the context. In Exodus 3, the burning bush, it's God himself. In other places, it's his 
personal representative. Now, how do I know which it is? You don't unless it's context. So the angel of the Lord, he's going to be identified with the Holy Spirit in this text. So I'm assuming it's God. And he's going to come to Peter, uh, Philip in a very specific way. Now, is this oral? It looks to me like it's oral and very specified. I want you to get up now and I want you to go here and I want you to speak. So here we have. Now, get up and go south. There is a two imperatives here. One of them can be a time element, but it looks to me like it's a, a direction and not a time element. So you, you can see my note with that. The desert road, there were several ways to get from where Philip was to where the Philippian jailer was heading back home. So the spirit told him exactly which one to go. Now, when it says this, this is a wilderness road, we've all asked, is that a comment by Philip or is that a comment by Luke? Uh, I don't know. And does it matter? It's still inspired because it's 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 trying to help those who don't know Palestine interpret where he's going. Notice where it says the court official. Now, literally, this is the word eunuch. Now, eunuchs were castrated servants at a king's palace or in a harem for sure. But we know Potiphar in Genesis is called a eunuch, but he had a wife. So it doesn't it came to mean a a a, a palace servant who didn't necessarily has to be castrated. I hope Daniel and his three friends were of that kind. <laughs> but anyway, he's an official of Candace. Now, Candace is the same as Pharaoh or Hadad or Caesar. It's a, the name of all the rulers of this particular uh, country, which is going to be south of Egypt at this point. Um, this is the same place where um, the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon. This is the same general area. Candace and and he's reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, this must have been a God-fearer. He was a wealthy person from a different country. He's coming to Jerusalem for a feast day, and he has enough money to buy a copy of Isaiah. Now, the Isaiah we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls is a 29-foot leather scroll. Oh, how expensive that must have been. This man was serious about wanting to know the word of God. He has this scroll, and he doesn't know what it means. So the Holy Spirit encourages Philip to run alongside this man's reading out loud as all the ancients read out loud all the time. Philip runs up beside him. Now he's got guards and everything with him. Philip, dangerous, run up beside him and said, do you understand what you're reading? That's a pretty good question, really. I, I think I want to ask that to a bunch of Christians I know. Do you understand what you're reading? Because I think you may be reading it wrong, reading too much of your culture, reading too much of your English definition of words, reading too much of your pet theories or denominational tradition. Do you understand what you're reading? So this is where context really becomes crucial. I'm surprised as I look at this that some of the verses he's using are not the ones I would pick out of Isaiah 53, but he, Philip started where the guy was reading and he talked to him about, about God. Um, let's see here. Uh, verse 31. I want to read this quickly. This is a quote from A.T. Robertson, his word pictures of the New Testament, six volumes, probably the best Greek scholar Southern Baptist have ever had. He says his comment on this verse, this is a mixed condition. It's a different kind of conclusion, but it looks like he's talking about that which is. So I don't know whether that's right or not. Verse 32 and 33. This is a quote from the Messianic passage in the Septuagint from Isaiah 53, 7 through 9. I'm surprised these verses that emphasize the Messiah are not mentioned here. However, Philip starts where the man was and explains the gospel to him. Philip opened his mouth <laughs> and the suffering servant is what he's going to talk about. And that's part of this kerygma of the early church. The Messiah came to die. Now, see, that's what so shocked the Jews. They were expecting a military leader like the judges to overthrow the Romans. And when Jesus wasn't like that, even John the Baptist wondered if he really was the Messiah. And then verse 36, the, the Ethiopian eunuch listened to what Philip said and said, look, here's water right here. What, what prevents me from being baptized? Let me ask you a question. Did, uh, did Philip send a carrier pigeon back to Jerusalem to get a vote from the church to baptize this guy? Uh, no. So what did he do? Philip baptized him. Why? Because the scripture said that and this man wanted it. Now, verse 37 is left out of most translations. Look at your study Bible, if you would. 
Verse 37 is not included in many modern translations. It's in the margin. And the reason it's in the margin, and it's, it's, it's an easy choice here. Just listen to what I'm saying. It's not in the Chester Beatty papyri, which is really early. It's not in the bottom of papyri, really early. It's not in any of the uncial manuscripts that our Old Testament is based on. Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus. In none of those. Neither is it in C. It's not in the Vulgate, it's not in the Peshitta, it's not in the Coptic, and it's not in the Ethiopian version. Verse 37 is not in the text. The UBS, United Bible Society's fourth edition, gives it an A rating of it not being included. So verse 37, it's interesting, it's the guy's confession, it's just added by a later scribe. Sorry, but I hope you have a note. If your study Bible doesn't tell you this, you need to get another study Bible. Now, when it says verse 38 and 39, now I am a Baptist, but I want to say to you, this is not a proof text for immersion. Is immersion valid? Yeah, I think immersion fits Romans 6 best, but it doesn't fit Titus 3 best, which is washing. It's not the form so much that we're worried about. It's the heart of the candidate. So even when Jesus was baptized, it says he went down in the water and he came out. Now, if you're a Baptist, you say that's immersion. But if you're some other denomination, that can mean walking down into the water and walking out of the water. It's ambiguous enough that we shouldn't be fighting over it. The key here is the heart of the candidate. You say, well, Bob, what about infant baptism then? Well, this is just my opinion. I'll give it to you quickly. I think the New Testament is talking about first generation Christians where all of them are old enough to respond. But the caveat here is there are several household baptisms. Uh, Paul mentions one, Stephanus. We've got Lydia and we got the Philippian jailer where the whole household is baptized, everybody in the house. Was there a child there? It looks to me like some groups go back to circumcision where a Jew is included in the family of Israel, the covenant people on the eighth day by circumcision. Now, later on, that person has to choose and live in faith to really be a covenant person. There's a lot of Jews who aren't right with God. So there's a faith element that must come in the life of the person who is circumcised at eight years old. In those denominations that do enter baptism, it's much like those of us who don't do baby dedication. It's a, it's a service that says, parents and church, you are committed to bring this child up in a knowledge of the gospel and encourage them to respond. And then at some point, usually around 12, they have a special training and a time for the person to personally receive Christ. Now, those of us in my denomination say not everybody is ready at 12, and I would agree with that. Does the New Testament teach believers baptism? Yes, it does, because it's dealing with first-generation Christians. I am not willing to fight this fight over this. I'm willing to say it's crucial that we trust Jesus and that we're baptized. Now, beyond that, I'm willing for some variety in the early church. You say, well, I'm not. Well, fine. You do it your way. Now, notice if you would here, um, the eunuch was worried about being accepted. Why? Well, number one, he's a eunuch, and there are some Old Testament texts that a man with crushed testicles cannot enter the kingdom of God. There, there's, a, there's a barrier to some kind of physical deformity. That barrier is down in Christ. Is it a racial barrier? This was a black man, probably. Is, is, there a, is there a racial barrier? No. Is there a wealth barrier? This man's obviously rich. No. So there, all these barriers are down. Is there a catechism issue? You got to know this and this and this before you're baptized. No. How much did the Philippian jailer know when he was baptized? How much did the Ninevites know when they trusted in God? <laughs> no, no. It's not, it's not a, a test you got to pass. All barriers are down in Christ. Ephesians 2, 11 through 3, 13 and so many other texts. Um, let's see. They went the way rejoicing. I would say that one of the marks of a true conversion is you really get happy. I think that's Romans 5 says that. It, it's over and over in 1 John 5, 1 John 1. There's a joy that comes with knowing Christ. If that joy is, if you don't have a joy in who you are in Christ, I think something wrong has happened to you. Now, there are a lot of damaged Christians, and maybe you're one, but joy is the norm of those who know who know God. Verse 40, Philip, uh, Philip continued his evangelistic ministry in the Palestinian um, town of Ashdod. That's Philistine. 
on his way home to Caesarea by the sea. Whoop! It's exciting stuff. What a great guy Philip was. Well, that's the end of my presentation, and I'd be so happy to talk to you to deal with your questions or comments. And I'm sure you have a lot tonight because I've really been picking at denominational traditions and trying to rile you up to get you to think. And I hope I've done that. So I'll be happy to be vulnerable to you and let you ask me what you want to. Yeah, so I think Malachi has a question. So Malachi, if you want to go ahead and open up your mic to ask your question. You know what? Actually, my wife had a question, but then when it came down to actually asking it, she got cold feet. Um, huh? Well, ask it for yeah. her. <laughs> what was the question, honey? Honey. <laughs> You're in big trouble, dude. You're in big I trouble. am in big trouble. <laughs> Well, right. whatever it is, oh. I'd be happy if you know that. Like, is it something I said about the traditions or? No, it was about verse um, <clears throat> 37. I, she was saying it, and then I was like, oh, well, we'll ask what you did. You know, we, we actually go to a Pentecostal church. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, we're, we're, we really enjoy it. But uh, I, I just, I see the benefit from. Yeah, I mean, even Calvinists, I'm not a Calvinist, but I see the benefit that so many different theologies have brought. And uh, I think it's a benefit to be able to like say, wow, this, that you have truth in that. Not, I think a lot of people yeah. throw the baby out with the bathwater and I, I don't want to do that. I like to sit and listen and um, I just, I'm, I'm really blessed to be able to do that. Yeah, I think I went to uh, my doctor's degree is from Trinity Evangelical in Deerfield, close to Chicago. And um, I remember getting to take the pastoral epistles with guys that were on the national staff of the Presbyterian Church and the Gospel Association of Canada and, and, and the Charismatic Churches. It was really interesting to see how each of them picked up on certain parts of the text that were in their traditions. But other parts were not in their traditions, you know, that other denominations yeah. picked up on. So what I've the last few years I've been saying that part of the difficulty in the church is the ambiguity of scripture itself, that it says things uh, that would be known to the people who first heard it in that culture, but are not known to us. And so because of our experiences with the Lord or with church, we pick up with other things. Our, we've, what we've got to be careful of is making it dogmatic that our way is the only way. So Absolutely. that's my, I hope you heard my discussion about the, the form of baptism and the time of baptism. I'm really mm -hmm. some slack on that. But it may be your wife is just bothered about a verse in the Bible not being there. And, uh, you know, some people have been taught that King James is inspired. And I remember I almost got fired the first year I came to the university where I teach when I went to a church and said, no, no translation is inspired. Oh, my goodness. You'd think I hit a hornet's nest. You know? <laughs> <laughs> really? It's unbelievable. So I think Christians, and I'm not using this word ignorant in an ugly way, we just have not taken the time to understand where we got our Bibles from. So I want to recommend a book. It's by F.F. F. Bruce, who I trust. And the name of his book on how we got our Bible is called The Books and the Parchments. And it's a really interesting book of how we our modern Bibles came to be. So yep. uh, that may be something that, that you might want to look at. We we watched a, a documentary. Uh, I think R.C. Sproul was in it. It was uh, The God Who Speaks. And they went through the different codexes. She has, she has her e ESV sitting here. And I have my new King James. And so we just cross-referenced yeah, the whole time. <laughs> Well, I think cross-referencing is good for this reason. What what comparing different translations by different theories does, it shows you the wide semantical field of words, that words yes. can be understood differently, and that constructions, Greek constructions, can be understood differently. And if you That's notice in my notes, when it's really difficult, I usually give four or five or six different translations for you to see how godly people understand this text in different ways. So... Thank you very yes, much. Sir. Anybody else? So we had a question from. Good evening, Paul. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Please. No, go ahead, Clive. Go ahead. Go ahead. Once again, thanks, um, Dr. Bob. I really appreciate um, your words of wisdom and going through the scriptures. And yeah, you was very right. You know, with doctor, you know, being 
sometimes we would say, you know, our, the, um, our traditions have kind of made the, the Bible of non-effect especially when um i've been in a you know being at a pentecostal church and we've always had that situation where we have to always you know that person has to say a sinner's prayer or they're not saved and you kind of hit it on the on the nail you know um there's no formula to this right. sinner's prayer so that really brought a lot of clarification to me in that situation so i really appreciate that um the question i had bob was um with simon the sorcerer, when it yeah. says that um, he kind of practiced, he in I think one scripture it says he had the um, community under a spell. What what does that mean? He had them under a spell. Yeah, I think was, it means that it he had he had influenced them by the tricks he had done. Now, was it supernatural tricks, i.e., he's a wizard or something, or was it uh, tricks that sometimes people do to get people confused? I, I can't answer that. But it looks to me like this guy, this guy tricked people, and boy, he got tricked by the gospel too. I mean, it it I think he's a I think he's a believer, though a weak one. So he was a charlatan and uh, he tried to buy the same power. But at the end he says, Oh, Peter, please pray for me. <laughs> oh, really, thank you. And Malachi, um, yeah, Dr. R. C. Scroll, yeah, I was um I'm very I know um, R.C. Scroll before he passed away, so I was at his, um, he has a Bible college that he, he has not too far from me. So I do listen to uh, R.C. Scroll also. It, it, it's just helpful to listen to different people from different perspectives. I don't know if you all ever noticed that on my webpage, there's a yellow box called World Voices. And I've included people that I don't agree with for sure on there because I think sincere Christians need to hear a wider perspective. And what we tend to be guilty of is only buy books that agree with us to back up our prejudice of denomination. So yes, we need to be challenged. And the way I think we can be challenged is, can you show me in the Bible where you got that, right? <laughs> and then I have the right to look at it, research it, pray about it, and then walk in the light that I have. I think that's healthy for all of us. Yeah, Malachi, did you have another question? I think I, I did. My my wife relayed the question to me, so <laughs> that so there. Um, what was it? It says when he found himself. I know people have mentioned they believe that means that he was supernaturally translated or or, or moved to that place. They got actually yeah. took him from one to the. Is that is that what it is saying there? Yes. Well, I don't know. And here's where the ambiguity comes. If we're talking about Elijah, <laughs> there was a transportation, right? If we're talking yeah. about Enoch. There was a transportation. Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all at a supernatural transportation from one point to another. But the other side is it just may mean that the spirit said you got to get up and go now. Right. So is it a, is it a supernatural event or a natural event? And I would say the text does not definitely tell us one or the other. But we shouldn't yeah. be surprised by either one. And and the gentleman who made the comment to me earlier, I, I always love his questions. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's awesome. Thank you. I know Cleve thanks you too. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bob, I, I feel sometimes like I'm like Paul, that I'm having scales knocked on my, off my eyes to <laughs> denominational and cultural scales. But hey, I would like to hear your comments uh, I use an NIV study Bible, and going to Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8, it says this is a virtual outline of Acts. Yeah. And however, there was not to begin this staggering task until they've been equipped with the power of the Spirit. Right. Right, no so, question. The words so, of Jesus is the outline for the entire book of Acts. Well, I have a, I don't know if you remember the introduction where I, I gave several possible outlines to Acts. And uh, I think the reason we're having trouble outlining Acts is the author had more than one purpose. Now, I think there's no question there's a geographical purpose. And I put it in the terms of overcoming racial barriers from Palestine locked up a room to the palace of Caesar. So every one of these people that the Jews thought 
didn't amount to anything. God didn't love starting with Samaritans and right on as God shows he did. Now, the other ones is there seems to be some summary statements. And that may be the way that Luke is outlining the spread of the gospel by these number summary statements. And the other one offhand, I've forgotten, but there's another way that Acts can be outlined. So, so I would say, for me, I think a, an easy way to see it is the, this is Acts 1, 8 must be true. And if you don't do it, then Acts 8, 1, <laughs> which means if you don't go, the hammer falls because God loves the world and he wants all of them to hear. <laughs> Thank you. I saw one on the chat, I think, Josue. Did you pick yes. that up? Okay. Yeah. So the first one from the, we have a couple from the chat. So the first one from the chat is from um, Brother Juan. So he said, Dr. Bob, talking about signs and wonders, we can see that because God is the same yesterday and today. But we must be careful with those who say God is using him to show us these signs and wonders. Am I right? Yeah, again, I, I would go back to that Matthew 24, 24, which says that this can be done by false teachers. Now, in Acts, it's done by godly people, right? I mean, the whole different group. You got the, the 12, you got the 70, you got the seven. Later, you got Paul. I mean, just supernatural events everywhere. But these same supernatural events can also be used to trick people. So this is where I would say to somebody, if, if a miracle occurs, I would check what the person is saying, not just what they're doing. If what they're saying fits the basic truths that we see in the sermons of Acts and in the truths of the New Testament, I would think they are God's person. No matter what they do supernaturally, if what they say does not fit the apostolic truths of the New Testament, they are a false teacher. Thank you. And then we had a question from YouTube um, from Bryce. So Bryce said, what are your thoughts on the practice of baptism being a requirement for taking the sacrament in a meeting or worship setting? Yes. Now, here again, we're getting into a event about like church membership. It, usually in my denomination, both of these have been connected to a local church because we want somebody connected to a group of believers. But I think biblically, it'd be very hard to try to find a text that says that baptism is an introduction into the denomination. I would say that baptism is introduction into the new life of Christ. I think there is an old man, new man barrier, but I, I don't think we can say that's the only way to do it. So nowadays, it looks to me like there are more weddings that have communion as a part of the wedding, which goes against that grain. And I think that I have been a part of baptizing people in swimming pools that was not connected to a local church and I didn't feel uncomfortable doing that but even when I do that I really want to encourage that person look this is not some kind of sacramental event you need a body of Christians to be with pray with love with cry with so don't let this substitute for finding a church where you feel apart because we are a Christian family we are a Christian community so I don't want to make these these wonderful events, some kind of, I did it myself for me and my family. No, no, you, when you trust Christ, you're a part of a much bigger family. And this corporate aspect is really crucial. Thank you. And then the last one from our um, Zoom chat was from Bill. So Bill said, one of the reasons I have always heard as the reason for immersion baptism was because we are buried in a, in a liquid grave and raised to newness of life in Jesus. He, and then he says, but I am personally open to different forms because burial forms also vary. Yes. Now that's what he's quoting is, and this is a probably, I know it's a Baptist tradition and it's based on Romans 6. Uh, Romans 6 talks about buried with him uh, and raised with him. So I think, I think immersion is a wonderful method for doing that. Is it the only method? Well, if you're in North Africa in the desert, you don't do immersion because there ain't enough water to do immersion, right? So the church did other forms of it. And so there was pouring. They poured enough water to be immersed in over your head. Uh, sometimes they just touch your forehead with a little water. There's just different ways to do it. Some of the ancient church had to baptize in running water three times face down in the name of the Trinity, all three times, every time, Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, see, the, these different forms basically are an outward form of an inner change. The inner change is you have trusted Christ and everything is new. Water 
can be used as a symbol of death and burial. It also can be used in the sense of cleansing or washing away sin. And I think uh, Titus 3, 5 comes closer to the Levitical washings necessary to approach God. So I, I say that I'm not so committed to the theology of the performer of the right. I'm not so much committed to exactly the formula we use in Jesus' name or in the Trinity's name. I'm not so concerned about what kind of water we use or where we put it. I am very much concerned with the heart. Now, if it's infant baptism, there has got to be a later personal reception. There's got to be a believing heart decision. So if you want to do christening at birth, then I think we've got to make uh, catechism or confirmation a really big, important, significant event and structure for it and really put a lot of effort into it. Um, so I just don't want to say this is the only way the early church did it, and this is the only way modern Christians ought to do it. Thank you. And then, Dr. Bob, we just had one question come in on YouTube. Okay. Um, so this is from Derek. So Derek said... What would your thoughts be on the early church, and then in parentheses, disciples, following or not following the directions that Jesus gave to them in Matthew 10? Now, let me look at Matthew 10 for a minute, because I'm not 100% what directions that is. Maybe You know what verse in Matthew 10, by any chance? Um, no, he didn't specify. Maybe he'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I'm, I don't know quite how to answer that question. I, I, I would say that I think the Christian life is a life of discipleship, not decision, because I think decisions really are the beginning of, of a life of, of service. So I'm committed to the all three salvation verb tenses, saved, being saved, have been and continue to be saved and shall be saved. So I would say that I, I've known a lot of broken hurting, ignorant believers that I still think are believers. So I don't want to make perfect Christianity the model, and I don't want to make sinless living the model, but I do want to make relationship the model. So if I can sin and not feel bad, I'm probably not a Christian. But if I sin and I it just bothers me so bad, I need to ask my daddy to forgive me and restore me, I'm confident he will. So it's a relationship issue more than a sacrament issue. And uh, that relationship certainly goes back to the words of Jesus and the apostles. Just real quickly, the red words in your Bible are not more inspired than the black words. <laughs> All the Bible is supernaturally inspired. That's at 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. So, but if he wants to clarify that issue, I'd be happy to wait for him to type something, but I, I just don't know exactly what, what he's mentioning there. Yeah, so he, he just clarified, or he just okay. sent a little bit more detail. Okay. So he said he's referring to when he sent them out with no money, no staff, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I personally would not make that a something that we should do today. Although it's kind of like the guy I see on the side of the road that's carrying Jesus' cross, you know. Um, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Is that meant to be f literally for every Christian? I, well, I don't think so, but... I think those guys who take physical crosses and walk around get to witness and relate to people that I never would in a church building. So if you feel committed, God bless you. If you felt committed like J.C. Penney that gave away all your, give away 90% of your money and keep only 10 and you felt that was God's will based on the widow's might and you know that, then I think God bless you, you got to do it. But I don't think every Christian has to feel that way to be pleasing to God. So I think those were particularly Jesus is saying, don't trust in your own resources, trust in my resources. So I think that was specific, wasn't a test, but it was a way to say, disciples, trust me, I'm going to provide for you. Is that what God should do to every one of us? Well, if that's true, we wouldn't go to school, we wouldn't have jobs, and we couldn't feed our family. So I think we can take these verses to the extreme, but the other side is I don't want to ignore them for the powerful spiritual truth that they teach. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that should be all of our questions talked about. Okay. Well, I've enjoyed tonight, and uh, next week we're going to be in Acts 9, which is uh, Paul's uh, Damascus Road experience. I think it'll be wonderful, so I hope you all will be able to tune in again. <music>